Welcome everyone to the Monday edition of Fair Territory. Quite a busy weekend, quite a lot to get to on the show today. We're going to talk about Paul Skeens, of course. We're going to talk about the demise of the Cardinals. And we're going to talk about the Giants' injury woes. I've got a special inside dish today. It revolves around hmm, Gatorade. Yes, Gatorade. And then your fan questions. John Fisher is one of them. Hmm, interesting. And we've also got questions about the Padres and a crazy trade that really is not so crazy. It's a proposal from a fan. But let's start off talking about the biggest news in baseball over the weekend. Really, maybe one of the bigger stories all year, the debut of Paul Skeens in Pittsburgh. And what a debut it was. 17 pitches over 100 miles per hour. That's pretty cool. You see the line there? It's a little bit deceptive. He left with a 6-1 lead and two runners on base. Both runners scored. Why? Because that was the inning, the less than immaculate inning in which the Pirates issued six, count them, six bases loaded walks. Uh, Pirates, you need to wake up here. That wasn't very good at all. A couple of things really stood out to me about Skeens and not so much on the mound. One was how he arrived at PNC Park. And this might be a little thing and you might say, Ken, what are you talking about? But look at this dude. He came in a suit. Full tie, full look, everything. Now, players routinely dress up, actually not even so routinely anymore, for getaway days when they're going to travel. Some teams require them to dress like that. But the Pirates were not in a situation like that. It was a Saturday game. They weren't traveling after the game. But this dude, he meant business. And this kind of impressed me. It's a little thing I know, but I remember Chris Paddock when he came up. He would do the same thing. And it's kind of a message that, hey, I mean business. The other thing that I wanted to mention regarding Skeens is something John Smoltz brought up on the Fox broadcast on Saturday when we were doing the Brewers Cardinals game. John asked the question, why was this guy in the minor leagues at all? Why was he wasting innings down there when he could have been pitching in the majors? And it's certainly a fair question. What the Pirates were trying to do was ramp him up slowly. Remember, this kid was in college last year. And they wanted to keep the intensity low at the start and then build up and bring him up, obviously, in early May and take it from there. John's point, and John is a Hall of Fame pitcher, of course, is that every inning you pitch in the minors is an inning you could have been throwing in the majors. And why not just take full advantage, ramp him up in the majors? Certainly a fair question. No one knows the answer on how to keep pitchers healthy on what the best ramp-up procedure is, on how many innings they should throw in a season. We don't have these answers. If we did, maybe pitchers would not be getting hurt at the rate that they are. Anyway, Skeen's debut is in the book. He pitches again on Friday, or at least he is scheduled to, against the same opponent he faced Saturday, the Chicago Cubs. This one will be at Wrigley Field, a place where we once saw Mark Pryor do some big things, Kerry Wood do some big things going way back to Ferguson Jenkins. He did some big things, historic ballpark, and Paul Skeen's second major league start. You see the Gatorade bath right there. We'll talk more about Gatorade in the next segment. Now, this weekend, I was in Milwaukee with John Smoltz, as I mentioned, and Adam Amin. We did the Cardinals-Brewers game, and it was quite interesting to see this series unfold. It was a four-game series. The Brewers won the first three games before the Cardinals finally salvaged the finale on Sunday. Now, what stood out to me here, what has stood out all season to people who follow the Cardinals, people paying attention to the game, is the way the Cardinals have started so slowly. It's almost like after their last place finish last year, we are witnessing the crumbling of an empire. Now, that might be overstating it, I know, but I think you guys know where I'm coming from. The Cardinals, again, are struggling big time here. You look at the NL Central standings right now. They're eight games back. Eight back in the NL Central, a division that is not considered particularly strong. They are 29th in runs per game. 29th in scoring, ahead of only the White Sox. And the rotation, which has been a surprise in some respects, better than some people thought it would be, certainly performed well for the most part, at least in our mind's eye. Uh, No, not really. 24th in rotation ERA. So over the weekend, John Mazalak, president of baseball operations, appeared on the Cardinals affiliate, KMOX. I guess it was his weekly appearance. 
and he was asked about the future of manager Ali Marmel. Now, the reason he was asked is because the Cardinals obviously are struggling so much, and this is the time of the baseball season when, if managers are going to get fired, it's usually around now, about 40 games in. And let's listen to what John Mazalak said, because I found it rather interesting. You're taking a lot of heat. Uh, everybody is. Uh, the ownership, you, Ollie Marmel, uh, there's no doubt, players. Uh, how do you see Ollie through all of this right now? What, what is your evaluation of your manager? Well, I think it's these, these are times that are difficult. Like, um, you know, I still think he understands the job. I think he knows how to manage. I think he's trying to, you know, put the right combination of players in. But, you know, at some level, you got to have some performance. And, um, yeah, I understand, like, fans are not happy with myself. They're not happy with Ollie. Um, I don't think anything I say here today is going to change that. So I think we have to just keep trying to go back and, and try to get this to work. And, you know, look, we, we understand if it doesn't, then, you know, people are going to be held accountable. And, you know, ultimately that starts with me. Now, votes of confidence can be empty. We all know that. But here's the problem if John Mazalak wants to dismiss Ali Marmel. The problem is he just gave him an extension on March 15th. March 15th, less than two months ago, the Cardinals extended Ali Marmel through 2026, another two years beyond this one. If John Mazalak wants to fire Ali Marmel, well, then the target becomes John Mazalak. And a lot of fans in St. Louis, a lot of Cardinal fans are upset with Mazalak as it stands for what has happened to this team over the years. So there is a lot of heat right now in St. Louis, and unless they turn it around, it's going to continue. I wrote today with Katie Wu of The Athletic about Paul Goldschmidt and his struggles. He is off to an awful start, seemed to come out of it a little bit yesterday, home run, game-tying single, but he has seemed to come out of it before at various points this season, hasn't happened. Goldschmidt and Arenado have not been themselves. Arenado better than Goldschmidt, but not all that much better. And this team as a whole, their young hitters haven't developed. They just aren't where they should be. So the Cardinals are definitely a team to watch in the week ahead and the months ahead as well. Another team I want to discuss right at the top here, the San Francisco Giants. Here is a team that had a lot of people excited at the start of the season they had done some things in free agency. Jung Hoo Lee, Blake Snell, Matt Chapman. They had traded for Robbie Ray, who is on the injured list right now, but is coming back. They were quite an interesting team. I failed to mention Jorge Soler. And yet they have been hit by the injury bug, perhaps as bad as any team. I want to show you who is on the injured list for the Giants right now. This is where it really hurts. Most of these are within the last week or two. Jung Hoo Lee, dislocated shoulder. Michael Conforto, Austin Slater. They lost an entire outfield this weekend. Jorge Soler, a recent addition to the injured list. Nick Ahmed, their shortstop, who had stabilized them at that position. And catcher Tom Murphy, their backup behind Patrick Bailey, who just came off the concussion list himself. Giants pitchers on the injured list. Blake Snell remains there. He's on a rehab assignment. Alex Cobb and Robbie Ray eventually expected back, and they will fortify the rotation. Tristan Beck, Ethan Small, and Austin Warren. The good news, the only silver lining here right now is that Blake Snell appears on his way back. He might be back in, as soon as this week. You can see right here, yesterday, immaculate inning, seven strikeouts in four perfect innings while rehabbing with the San Jose Giants. It's a Class A, I believe. So Blake Snell could be rejoining that rotation, hopefully in better form than he was to start the season. And then maybe that will begin the Giants' in a better way, in a better place, because right now they are not in a good place. So they've got to get some injured players back if they want to have any chance in the National League West. Time now for the Inside Dish. This is the part of the show where I talk maybe about something I've written, maybe a trend in the game, maybe something else entirely, something almost completely off the grid. That's what I'm going to do this week. I'm going to talk about an occurrence in each of the last two weeks while I was on Fox, yes, I'm talking about Gatorade baths. Now, I recognize Gatorade baths when you're a dugout reporter doing post-game interviews are an occupational hazard. They happen. They're unavoidable. Players seem to love them. Fans seem to love them. The only people who maybe do not love them are people like me, dugout reporters, the men and women who get their clothes ruined on occasion. 
And I want to talk about this because we had a clothes ruining situation. Yes, we had it two weeks ago. Here it is. Orange Gatorade. Kevin Cash sets the Rays franchise record for all-time wins by a manager. Appropriate to interview him. I didn't see this one coming. A Rays coach out of the corner of my eye approached. Well, you can see the corner of my eye is not picking this up. But it was a Rays coach, and I am going to ask our great investigators, Katie Strang and Britt Giroli, to get on this immediately to find out which Rays coach was the guilty party. Why do I care? Because that suit, you don't really see it right there. That suit got ruined by the orange Gatorade. Now, I can't exactly ask the Rays to buy a new suit. Why? Because they have no money, right? If they buy me a new suit, they're probably going to trade Randy or Rosarena. Oh, and here you go. This week in Milwaukee, Reese Hoskins. This is an interesting story, actually. So shortly before the game ended, Reese had hit a go-ahead three-run homer in this game. Big home run. Shortly before the game ended, one of the photographers where I was, I'm always in the photo pit with the still photographers. He asked me, are you doing a post-game interview? I said, why are you asking? He said, because the Brewers have been dunking every guy lately. I was like, okay, I'm going to be at least semi-ready. So initially, Hoskins was standing on the other side of me. I put him on that side so at least I could possibly see this coming. I saw it coming. I still couldn't avoid it entirely, even though Fox said I did. Nah, it still got the suit pretty wet. And it's the same as before. I can't ask the Brewers for a new suit because they're a low revenue team. They're just going to trade Willie Adamas if they pay for a new suit. Now, you might say, Ken, whoa, whoa, whoa. Doesn't Fox give you all the suits you want? Well, yeah, they give me suits on occasion, but it's not an endless supply. Now, there have been some very memorable moments over the years where I've been dunked. Now here, this is the 2014 division series, I believe. This is one of my all-time favorite pictures. Yes, this was a complete immersion. That's Matt Kemp. He had hit a go-ahead homer in the ninth. That was a big emotional win for the Dodgers in game two. That was a big one. Now, this one, the next one we see here, that's the Houston Astros. I don't remember the year exactly, but if you want to know why I was hell-bent with Evan Drellick on breaking the sign-stealing scandal, well, this might give you a little hint. And as we go forward, this is the all-time offensive one. Two Hall of Famers right there, Max Scherzer and Bryce Harper. This was in the period in 2015 in which the Nationals were not doing Gatorade. No, 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 no. They were doing chocolate. Harper, I guess, had hit a big homer. And there's Scherzer, dousing him with chocolate. That suit, by the way, was ruined. That one never came back. This one right here. This is the only forgivable dunking of my career, and you can see why. It's Bill Murray in the winning clubhouse after the Cubs beat the Indians back then in the 2016 World Series. I was interviewing him on Fox and he said, Kenny, you're looking awfully dry and Bill Murray dunked me with champagne or doused me with champagne, I should say. So there you have it, one bath after another. And this week, I've got the Padres at the Atlanta Braves. So I'm issuing a warning right now to the Atlanta Braves. No shenanigans, no Gatorade, None of this monkey business. Please, just this once, let me stay dry. Time now for Grilling Ken, the part of the show where you guys get to ask me questions and we have some doozies this week. Let's start with the first one this week. It comes from Chris Teven, Bay Area Tivo 91, who asked, Ken, what would be the first question you would ask John Fisher if you had the chance to interview him? Chris, great question. I love it. And my question would be, John Fisher, what are the A's payrolls projected to be? What do you expect them to be in the three years that you're going to be in Sacramento, 2025, 26, and 27? Now, the reason I want to ask this question is because I've reported that the A's are planning to ramp up during that time in Sacramento to the $130 million to $150 million range in payroll and then be at 170 by the time they get to Vegas the scheduled time they get to Vegas in 2028. I want to hear it from John Fisher's mouth. I want to hear him on the record saying what the payroll might be. He's not going to say that. He's not going to answer the question. Well, I want that too, because sometimes no answer is as telling as an answer. So that would be my question. John Fisher, what are your payrolls going to be? Because guess what, people? I've said this before. I'm a little suspicious that they're not going to be at 130 to 150 over the next three years. All right, time for the next question now. This one's good too. I like all of them this week, actually. 
This one comes from Stephen Rappel. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Stephen. He asks, I'm a Tiger fan, and people think I'm crazy for suggesting Scooble should be shopped to the Orioles for holiday. Is it crazy? Maybe the Orioles say no, but a postseason headed by Scooble Burns would be hard to pass up. Would have to be hard to pass up. Tigers could use a transformative bat to pair with Green. Stephen, you're not crazy at all. I've heard a lot worse ideas over the years from fans. And here's why this one's interesting, because you identified with each team their particular needs. The Orioles, sure, one more starter would make them that much more formidable, you would expect if they reach the postseason. And the Tigers, they've got pitching. They don't have offense, or at least enough offense. Now, Tariq Skubal is their ace. He is a Cy Young contender. So if you're trading him, you're trading your best pitcher. I understand that. But here's why this is interesting. Skubal is a guy that we think is kind of a newcomer, right? But he actually only has two years of control left after this one. He had Tommy John surgery in 2016 while at Seattle University. Then he had flexor tendon surgery last year. So he's got a bit of an injury history. There's no question about that. And only two years of control after this one. That said, he is a legitimate ace. And if you're the Orioles, we know that Jackson Holiday was the number one overall pick in the draft. We know he's the game's number one prospect. And we know that he is expected to be a big star in this game. You don't want to trade him. Could you justify it? Actually, you probably could at least entertain it. Here's why. Jordan Westberg becoming a star at second base. Gunnar Henderson is a star at shortstop. They've got a great third base prospect, Kobe Mayo, who's tearing it up at AAA. They could afford to trade another infielder, even after trading Joey Ortiz to the Brewers for Burns. So I don't expect the Orioles would do it because Holiday will have either five or six years of control left after this season, Scooble only the two remaining. But at the same time, it's an intriguing thought. And again, a position player is generally more reliable than a pitcher. And with Scooble's injury history, you might not want to take that chance. Jackson Holiday, if you think he's going to be a superstar, uh, probably don't want to trade him. I get it. But I don't know that it's that ridiculous an idea. If I were the Tigers and I'm interested in doing this, I probably would want to add a reliever to that deal to sweeten it further for the Orioles. I think you need to. Okay, final question from this week. This comes from First Team All Energy. I can't even pronounce his handle. He asks, or she asks, do you still consider the Padres no competition for the Dodgers even after they won two out of three series versus them and split the Korea series, making them five and three on the year? It's not that they're no competition for the Dodgers, the Padres. They are. Of course they are. They've got a lot of good players. They just added another one last week, Luis Arise. They're still five and a half games back in the National League West. And over the course of the season, I don't expect the Padres to compete for the division title with the Dodgers. I don't expect any team in the West to do that. The Dodgers have too many weapons, too much depth. Over 162 games, I fully expect them to be the best team in that division and maybe the best team in the National League. The question comes in once the postseason hits. And what have we seen the last two years? 2022, Padres knocked the Dodgers out in the division series. 2023, Diamondbacks knocked the Dodgers out in the division series. In a short series, could the Padres beat the Dodgers? You bet they could. We've got Dylan Cease, you Darvish, maybe Musgrove is healthy by then. Who knows? Maybe A.J. Preller trades for another starter. They've got Michael King, who's pitching really well. So in a short series, I could see it. But over the 162, no, I do not see the Padres overtaking the Dodgers. It's not to say that they're no competition for the Dodgers. Obviously, they are. They're playing them really tough so far in the regular season. It's just that... Over 162, the deepest roster generally prevails. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. Thanks, everyone, for watching, for listening. You know where to find us. YouTube, Apple, Spotify. Subscribe to us. Like us. We will be back Thursday, the regular show, with Alana Rizzo. Have a great week, everyone. If you're new to the uh, BetMGM party, the bonus code is FOUL. Sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into your account and then place a wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. And if that happens, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern, call 1-800-GAMBLING. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. Fair Territory airs each week, and we'd love for you to become part of our community. Here's another video you might enjoy. See you next time.